please, and go to the book of Psalms, and we're going to look at Psalm 127, 127. It's the same psalm that's on the banners, and it's part of our theme this year, Accept the Lord, Build the House. And I want to bring a second message from this psalm. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, we're grateful for this hour in which we have the wonderful opportunity to sit under the teaching of your word. And it is a wonderful opportunity because so many are ignorant of you and your ways. And we have the privilege each week of being under the sound of thy word. And we're thankful. And we're thankful that it still speaks to our lives today, that you, you and your wisdom wrote a book that applies to all people in all places at all times. Now, Lord, I don't know everybody in this room well. You know them intimately down to the number of hair, hairs on their head. And you care about them far more infinitely than I ever could. So by your spirit, take the words of this preacher, accomplish spiritual work in each heart, and suit a special message because you are the Lord of the scripture. Please meet the need of each heart, we pray, in these next moments. And we are asking this for Jesus' sake. Amen. We are builders. Whether the weather, uh, when the weather is balmy, rather, we build sandcastles by the sea. When our space becomes limited, our wives tell us to put up more shelves or to build an additional room. And slowly over time, most of us work to put it back a little bit, build up a little bit of a retirement plan so that we're prepared for the future. We're builders by nature. We like to take what we have and make it bigger, better, stronger if we can. But this psalm reminds us, as we looked at last week, that we cannot build alone. Because if we build without the help of the Lord, what we'll end up with ultimately will be, what's the key word from last week? Useless. So we return today to the psalm. But today I want to bring a different message, a different emphasis and I bet you're going to be able to pick it out on your own. You don't even need me. Uh, don't think that way. I still <laughs> That kind of slipped out, right? But you don't need me to figure this out because it's right in the text. You're going to see it right in front of your eyes. You can look on the screen or if you have your Bible open to Psalm 127, let's read verses 3 to 5 again. Psalm 127, lo, verse 3, children are in heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. Now, what are these verses about? Don't be bashful. You can say, you can talk. You can talk to me. It's okay. I'm, I'm going to let you do that. Family. That's the right answer. We're talking about family. Or children. What did we talk about last week? We talked about building a house. And we talked about waking to watch a city. How do we get the family in the same psalm? You know, actually, some people think that these were two different poems and that sometime in Israel's history they got mashed together. Because there's, on the surface, it appears that there is a big contrast between building houses and watching cities in the first couple of verses, and the blessing of family in verses 3 to 5. But I don't really think that was the author's intention, and I don't think these are two different poems that got mushed together. I really believe the psalmist is after the same thing. Last week we considered two enterprises, building a house, watching a city, both we need the help of the Lord or our work will be in vain. In verse number 3, I think he introduces a third enterprise for which we need the Lord's help or all of our building will be in vain. What is that enterprise? We already heard the answer, and it is class family. I need the help of the Lord to build my family. The title of the message today is Build Your House. But I'm really concerned with family. 
And he, the author, really focuses on one particular category or grouping in the family, and that is in verse number 3, children. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord. Now, just to give a little bit of additional support to my theory on this, I want you to consider these other things that kind of hold or unify or pull together this whole psalm. In verse number 1, except the Lord build the house. The word house in Hebrew can refer to a brick and mortar structure or it can refer to the family that lives inside that structure. And the word for build in Hebrew, and those of you who know Hebrew a little bit, right? Ancient Hebrew was just consonants and you had to supply the vowels. Now, the Masoretes helped us out in uh, they, they lived approximately, you know, 100 through 1000 AD and they added vowel pointing. So uh, we Americans can kind of figure out Hebrew now. Well, some of us can. So, but the Hebrew letters for build are B N M, B N M. And the word for children or sons in verse number three has the same three letters B N M. So if you were reading ancient Hebrew, the words would look the same, but they would mean two, two different things. It's almost as if the psalmist is doing wordplay. We do this in English, right, where you take words that sound like something else and you mean so. Jokes are like this, right? We take one thing and we twist the word around and it makes it funny. And so there's a wordplay going on here, and I think that's what he's after. You can build a building, builders do, b and m or you can build a family with children, B and M, same thing. So I think this psalm is really linked together. We're after today this idea that we've got to build more than just a church. Hey, you got that bookmark, right? Some of you still have it. Do you have it? Some of you maybe have left it at home. On the back, there are three bullets on, my, on the bookmark, right? We can build a church. What's the second bullet? We can build families and we can build our lives. And I want you to see that just building a church, if that's all we did, I want, I want to build a church, this, you understand, I want to build a church, but if that's all we did this year, that would not be enough because God wants us to invest in building our homes. And you know, in all the things that we get caught up in in American culture and materialism and getting ahead and working a, a second job and getting this degree so I can make a better salary, we get really busy in building things and building our equity and our net worth and our future, and often the family gets left behind. And sadly, the family gets neglected, so I really want to focus in on and I want to encourage us about the importance of building in our home. None of us are perfect at it, but we ought to all be working at it, especially with the help of the Lord, because unless I work with God to build my house, someday someone else is going to knock it down. And I want to build a house that lasts. Well, how can I do that? The psalmist, I think, provides three perspectives of why it's important for you and me to build our homes. Let me give those to you. The first one is in verse 3, and it is children or a gift from heaven. That's a first per perspective on family the psalmist wants us to see. Let's be honest. In our culture, children are not highly valued. We find them highly annoying. <laughs> That's the truth. We look at them more as a burden than a blessing. And if we choose to have them Please let them grow up. Get through the terrible twos and the terrible teens so we can just... You know what I mean, right? And if we do have children, we, can only, we should only have a few and only when we're emotionally and economically prepared to handle them. Who is ever emotionally and economically prepared to handle kids? All right. I'm getting off course already. I didn't even intend to go there. Of course, the Bible has a completely di different take on children, right? They're a blessing whenever they show up in whatever home they happen to be. Children, this verse says, are an heritage from the Lord. We shouldn't let the responsibility of rearing them color our thinking against them. And we should think of this in terms of other blessings that the Lord says 
in the Old, Old Testament, he often had, if you will do this, Israel, if you will obey me, then I will give you X, right? It, those of you who are familiar with the Bible know this. If this, then this. And we ought to think of children that way. If I invest in them and take the responsibility for them, then eventually I will enjoy the payout for them. Lo, children are in heritage of the Lord. And these two words in the verse, we're going to look at the word heritage in the word reward, remind us that children are a gift. Now the word heritage is the Old Testament word often translated in the Psalms, portion, and in the Old Testament narratives, inheritance. Portion or inheritance, it's your estate, what you get. And God is calling the children that he gives to your home, he's calling them part of your estate. Now, he spoke of the promised land this way. Did Israel earn the promised land? No, if anything, they tried to stay away out of the promised land. Remember Kadesh Barnea? We're not interested. They got giants up there. Somewhere else, Lord, please. Did they deserve the promised land? No. God gave it to them. In fact, when they entered the promised land, remember, God went with them. The captain of the Lord of hosts went with them. So what happened with the walls of Jericho? The Israel built these big battlements and the big catapults and knocked the walls down, right? That's the way the story... No, you know better than that. God knocked the walls down. And then they had the big southern confederation under Adonai Bezek, and God destroyed a much greater and better equipped and trained army than Israel, and he gave it. And then they turned and went north to a northern confederation under Jabin, and again God gave them great victory. And within a few weeks, the whole of the promised land belonged to Israel. God gave it to them. It was their inheritance. They didn't earn it. We need to think of kids this way. They're not just a product of bio biology, right? God is the one who favors a family. And if you've been in part of a family or known someone in your family, a couple can't have kids. Boy, they understand children are an inheritance from the Lord. And if he didn't favor the genes and make it possible, none of us would have kids. You know, honestly, even in procreation, all we make is a contribution, and God takes over and takes two cells and multiplies them to two trillion in nine months to make a baby happen. Children are in heritage of the Lord. In the Israelite psyche, we need to kind of back up and think about this text the way the Hebrews would. In the Israelite psyche, men children, male children, were to be preferred over female children. I'm not saying it was right, I'm just saying that's the way it is, all right? I'm, not, I'm just, get the background right here. These are Israelites and the father's legacy, his name, the strength of the family is connected to having sons. I remember talking to Billy Allardyce, a missionary friend. He had four sons. And uh, whenever he, in France they have a lot of Muslims, and when he would talk to them, they always admired him because Muslims think the same way today, that having sons is everything and daughters are like, well, you know a little bit of the culture, right? And they just, how did you end up with four sons? And um, they looked on him as being blessed to the Lord. So it was in the Israelite psyche, right? And the word children in verse number three, as I've already hinted at, is the plural form of ben, which is B-E-N. That's the Hebrew word for son. If you add the M, it makes it plural. So a B-N-M, he was talking about sons. Lo, sons are a heritage from the Lord. They were and are the strength of a family. But the second half of the verse gives the parallel expression, right? The fruit of the womb is his reward. And daughters are included here. <laughs> All right. Everybody can breathe deeply, right? It's going to be okay. They too are a reward from the Lord. And again, and again, the emphasis of the second half here is their reward. You don't earn them. God gives them. He rewards you with them. So what's happening in your home right now with your kids? Are things chaotic? Are you experiencing trials with a teen? 
we really need to regain perspective. God still says your children are a gift and they're a reward. I know they give you headaches, but they're a gift and they are a reward. In the middle of parenting years, the days may seem hard and long, but you need to remember that God gave them as a gift. And soon in time, the gift will prove to be a reward to you as you raise your children for the Lord. Hey, can I talk a little bit about this passage in future parents? Some of you aren't yet parents. You will be parents down the road. You ought to look at children as a blessing, not to be avoided, but to have if you can. Doesn't always happen in every family, but if you can, you ought to join God in building your home with children. And what about you that are past childbearing years? You're like, uh, that's past. Well, that can't happen. God's people ought to always be champions for children in the next generation, in the next generation, encouraging life from the womb to the tomb. Children are a gift. They're a reward. And that's regardless of how the fruit gets there. There's differences of opinion on the stance that Christians ought to take on the subject of abortion. But the Bible says here, the fruit of the womb is a reward. And that is true regardless of how the pregnancy ended up in that womb. There will always be unwanted or ill-timed pregnancies, but there ought never be unwanted children because they're a blessing from the Lord. They're a gift from heaven. So, Dad or Mom, start right there. If we're going to gain perspective, if we're going to be builders with God in our home, we first got to think children are a blessing and not a bane. We've got to embrace that perspective. Secondly, in verse number four, he says that they are arrows. Let's look at that. Verse number two, uh, four, rather, as arrows are in the hand of a mighty man, so are the children of the youth. The second is a weapon in the hand. Arrows in the hand. So are the children of one's youth. That's a strange word picture, right? Arrows? Children? But I think it's a clever metaphor, and I want to share with you just some meditations or ruminations on this idea that children are like arrows. Maybe you've had opportunity to think about this. I hope to expand a little bit of your thinking, all right? How are children like arrows? Here's the first idea. Each arrow is unique. Each arrow is unique. Before the days of modern manufacturing where you could mass produce thousands of the same thing that all look the same, feel the same, look the same, you had to make your arrows by hand. And some uh, Native Americans have explained this, right? They would they, they take straight twigs and they would carve them and make them as straight as possible. And then they would put in a piece of flint at the front and they'd wrap it tight so the flint wouldn't fly off the arrow as it flew through the sky. Then they would, they would uh, customize the, the, the fledging that goes on the back to help steer or guide the arrow. And they, depending on what bird they used, it, it would be different colors. And each man did his a little bit differently so they could tell one person's arrows from another person's arrows. And what a fitting metaphor that is for kids because if, if you as a parent have tried to raise kids, you, you try to pump in the same energy you do to each one of them and, 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 but they all end up being unique. They have their unique personalities and their, their unique interests. And they come with the same raw material. You were there on their birthday when they came into the world. But boy, as soon as from that point on, they fly in different directions. Because each arrow is unique. That's even true with identical twins. I'm a twin, but not identical. But even with identical twins, parents get get so familiar, they can always tell the two kids apart, right? Because they are unique. And so it is with arrows. Here's another thought I had about arrows and children, right? The more arrows you have, the better chances you have to survive. Nobody goes into battle with just one or two arrows. Remember, Elisha got mad at that one king whose name was it Josiah. That wasn't Josiah. It was another one. He only th shot three arrows. He could have had much more victory. If he, but nobody goes into battle with just three arrows. You have as many arrows as possible. Remember when David went to fight Goliath? He only took one stone. He knew he was going to hit it on the first try, right? How many stones did David take? 
He took five smooth stones so he had a backup if the first one missed. And this is the mentality that we ought to have about children. Hey, one, children, one child is great, but two children are better. And we ought to think that, that bigger families are a blessing and not a curse. I, I, not everybody is capable for various reasons of having multiple children, but we ought to be thinking that the more children I have, the better off I am. And this is true for a guy, especially in ancient times, because there were, were high infant mortality rates because they didn't understand the germ theory of disease, and often kids perished. Susanna Wesley, some of you know her because she was the mother of John and Charles Wesley. John Wesley is a great preacher, and Ch uh, Charles was the great hymn writer. He wrote And Can It Be and a number of other songs. So both well-known Christians. Susanna Wesley, do you know how many children she had? All right, she lived in a different day than we did. She had a large family. She and her husband Samuel had 19 children. Nine of them died in infancy. Because of that, multiple children were preferred in past generations. I don't think we need to give up on that so soon. We ought to have an affinity or appreciation for families that are on the larger side. Now, some people think I've overdone it. I have five. <laughs> but we have friends that have, uh, a friend here in town has 11 children. I was standing in the airport just a week ago. I flew home. Uh, I, I helped Joshua back to college, and I flew home. And I was standing in the Charlotte airport uh, getting ready to board my flight. And, you know, and, and, I, and I was deep, I was flying economy, so I was like, you know, in the back of the line. And a bunch of people were in front of me. And, and a, a couple of guys, young guys, you know, in, in late 20s, maybe early 30s, they were standing there chatting. And uh, they obviously were pros at flying, you know, they had it down, they had the right size bag, and they're just chatting. And, and what I was able to pick up from them is that they were, were both in some branch of the military. They were talking military stuff. And um, so I was listening to them. And then they called for the pre-board or the early board. You know how they do for people that need wheelchair or help. and Kids. All right, so the stroller comes out, and a mom pushes up with a stroller, and she's got a toddler daughter beside the stroller. And dad and mom are trying to get their kids, you know, on the airplane. And one of the military guys says to the other, and no offense if you're in the military, it's just, it's, this is what happened, all right? And so, so the one guy says, yeah, he says, I was on a flight here a few weeks ago. Yeah. And you're not going to believe this. A family had seven kids. <laughs> seven kids. And they were, and he started, yeah, one was like 18 or 19. It was all the way down to, you know, what. And he was just appalled that a family would have seven kids, for crying out loud. What were they thinking? And he even said something like that. I don't, I don't even know. What, what were they thinking? And, you know, that kind of thinking permeates not just the culture out there. It permeates the thinking in here. And are you ever guilty of like, oh, dear, there's one of those families that can't figure out, you know, how these things work. You know, they really need to talk to a doctor. <laughs> But chances are they're not, you're not applauding with them in your heart. But according to this verse, you should be because lo, children are in heritage of the Lord. The fruit of the womb is his reward. Verse 5, happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. Nobody goes into battle with one arrow. Why would you go through life with only one kid if you could have more? All right. We ought to think well of people. We may not be able to go back and change our history, but we can applaud those who are writing history in our day and choosing to have more arrows because more arrows are a blessing. Hey, here's another thought about arrows. Are we done with arrows yet? I'm not done with arrows. Stick with me, all right? Arrow, arrows, next. Straight arrows fly best. 
You know, sometimes you take a twig off a tree and you start carving it, and there's like this little knot, this little knob on it. You try to scrape it. Well, maybe you don't, but the people that make arrows try to do that, and they can't get it straight enough. And eventually they decide, you know, that one ain't going to work. Throw that stick out. I'm going to start working on another one to shape another arrow because only straight arrows fly the best. What a great metaphor that is for kids, right? We want straight arrows so they fly well in life. And how desperately parents work with their kids, right? Please listen to me. Please try to, please try to see it my way. I'm trying to help you. <laughs> All right, that's the Holy Spirit telling me to settle down. All right, I've, I've lost the clip, so if anybody sees it, the little black piece, it just fell off. I don't know where it went. It might be in my pocket. Thanks. Yeah, so we're trying to, we're trying to help our kids learn about life straighten them out, shape them, because straight arrows fly best and long. And we want our kids to fly right in life, right? We don't want to, no one can get, I want to have a kid and I want him to go to jail. <laughs> really, I'm just really hoping for that because I don't get to visit there. I just, <laughs> doesn't happen. All right, where are we? Next one, arrows are ready to fence. This is actually primary, the primary thing I think the author intended is that having arrows provide a ready defense for the warrior. To approach battle without arrow, arrows could prove fatal, and to approach the challenges of life without the help of children is unwise, if not fatal. How so? Well, think about this. In an agrarian culture especially, a man had to face all his battles alone if he didn't have children. Or think about a farmer. Some of you grew up on farms, right? The more children you had, the more workers you had. And not just for chores, because there's going to be a day when you can't go into the fields and you can't slaughter your own meat, and you want to have kids that can go into those fields and harvest the crops and slaughter the meat so you have something to eat when you can't do it anymore. And so children were like arrows because they provided a refuge or defense of, of security in later years. You see in the picture? What the psalmist is trying to get you to see is children are a gift, and they're like arrows, a weapon in your hand for life. You, it, this is really worthwhile. You ought to really spend some time with your family. Don't think about taking a second job so you can get ahead or, or, or taking that job which is going to cause you to travel out of town and miss your family more. No, invest in your family. It's worthwhile because they're a gift from heaven, and they're a weapon in your hand for all of life. There's no more nobler profession than to work at building your family Final thing, then I'm through. They're also, here we find a perspective that children are a promise of happiness, a promise of happiness. We see that in verse 5. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. The word happy is often found in the Psalms. It is either translated happy or most of the time it's translated blessed. If you have your Bible open, the same word appears as the very first word of the next Psalm. Blessed is everyone that feareth the Lord that walketh in his ways. Here he talks about a man who's blessed because he fears the Lord and he has a family. I don't have time to read the psalm. I love the psalm, but that's not the message today. The point I'm trying to make is you are happy and blessed if you have kids. And that's what the psalmist is saying, not just in this psalm, but in the companion one that follows. That's true if you're Jew or Greek, Israeli or American. He who has a family will be happier in the end than the man who does not. And here's why. He gives you two reasons. The first one is found right here in verse 5. He has his quiver full of them. That means, I believe, that he's not alone in old age. I've already hinted at that in the previous one because arrows are a ready defense. They're with him in old age. A man who has a quiver full of children is not likely going to be lonely. He's going to have somebody to care for him and his needs. In a culture that didn't have work benefits, you know, retirement packages, IRAs, your ch the children, multiple children, were the best hope on security in later life. 
If you look at parenting only from the perspective of right now and the grief they cause you, or the dirty diapers you have to attend to, or the cranky spirits you have to deal with in the morning and in the evening and everywhere in between, um, you're going to think parenting is the worst thing in the world. Who would want to do that? But if you look, take the long look. Take the long look. Solomon talks about this in the book of Proverbs. Take the long look. Don't think about right now. A Christian doesn't think about the here and now. He thinks about the there and then. That's what you believe by faith, right? I believe in a, I believe in a heaven and I believe in a real God and I believe in a Jesus who came to link me to heaven and I am living with my eye on that. That's the long look. If you look at Christianity simply from what it gives you right now, you're going to be sadly disappointed. You're going to be like, who would want to do this? i got to go to church every day, and they're asking me to give me 10%, and they want me to serve too? That's way too much. If you only think about Christianity, about what it requires for you right now, you're going to be disappointed and disillusioned. But a Christian has a low look. He's thinking about eternity. He's thinking about his sins forgiven and right, righteous relationship with God and being in uh, everlasting uh, bliss with a, with a heavenly father. So I got to keep the long look. And that's only one example, but all of Christianity is like, I got to keep a long look. If I look at what's going on right now, I'm going to get frustrated, give up. I don't like this trial. I don't like this, these people. I quit. Listen, I'm talking to somebody out there right now. You're right in the middle of it. And you don't like the, the dish that God served up in front of you last week or this week or what's ahead. But if that's all you think about, you're going to get disgusted and throw it aside. But you got to keep the long look. Christians think, I'm living for what is to come. And I have to do that in parenting, right? If I look at today, this is a bad idea. Who was thinking about kids? This is her fault. <laughs> but I got to keep the perspective, right? Children are a gift from heaven. They're weapons in my hand. And when are they most valuable? When I can no longer stand up for myself. They'll be there for me. I will not be alone. It's the long look that makes parenting worthwhile. Se a second thought, and then I'm through. He also says in this verse, Happy is a man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed... That's where the words are. They shall not be ashamed, but shall stand uh, before the enemies in the gate. Now, what does that mean? Well, to understand that, we first have to identify what the they is referring to. The they is a pronoun, and so we have to go back and look for something called an antecedent. Antecedent is the noun that comes before the pronoun and tells me what it means. The closest plural antecedent is the word children in verse number four, but I don't think it's talking about children. It's, the children, it's not the children who are not ashamed. It's the old guy who's not ashamed. You need to understand in poetry, right? Clarity isn't the main thing. Structure, rhyme, rhythm, the structure of the poem is the most important thing so that they hear, even though there's not a direct antecedent, it's the man. Happy is the man or all the men that have full quivers because they will not be ashamed. Did you get it? It's the man or the men who choose to build a home and they choose to build a family with children and not just live for themselves. Those people are not going to be ashamed. Why? Because they're going to be able to stand up to their enemies in the gate. What's the gate? This isn't talking about foreign enemies. This is talking about the people that criticize domestic problems. Somebody sues you and takes you to court. That's where, the, that's where court was held. Or a business transaction goes sour and somebody's suing you for the rest to make up for the debt. This is what it's talking about. Poor the man who has to stand there by himself and make his own defense. But if he has four boys. <laughs> I got four boys. Two on this shoulder, two on that shoulder. Yeah, so what's the, what seems to be the problem, sir? And the muscle standing beside you adds a little weight to your case. That's what he's talking about. 
got to take the long look to see this. If you take the long look about kids, when they're all grown up, you're not going to be alone in your old age, and you're not going to be ashamed because you have nobody to stand up and take your side in the end. Take the long look. Why is this perspective so important? Because if you don't have the right perspective about kids, you'll cast this aside and you'll chase buying one Corvette, then a Camaro, and that doesn't satisfy, so you get a Mercedes. Mercedes didn't satisfy, so you get a Porsche, and the Porsche didn't satisfy, so you up your game and you get a Lamborghini. Okay, you get the idea. Cars might not be your thing, but we all do that to a certain degree. But we need to think building a family, building a home is worthwhile, and I ought to give myself to it. Unless I work with God to build my house, somebody else is going to knock it down. Two, men, uh, two women were in a laundromat. I know we don't do that now. We're rich. We have the laundromat in our house somewhere. But it used to be that you went to a laundromat and did your laundry. So the story is somewhat dated. But it's helpful to wrap this up. So two women are doing their laundry, and they're a little chat, uh, chatting back and forth uh, across the, the machines. And, and one of them is, yeah, my husband is so miserable. He hates his job, and they hate him. And when he gets home, it's no better. The kids don't respect him. And they're, yeah. Uh, and when he sits down on the couch, just stares blankly at the TV, nothing worthwhile to watch on there. Well, we can agree with that part of the story. And when he goes to church, he says that the services are long and the preacher is boring. The other wife, the other woman said, you know, my, my, my husband is so excited. He loves his job and he loves what he's doing and loves coming home and spending time with the family. And uh, when we go to church, he, he loves the preacher's sermons. He's getting, he gets something out of them every week. Well, the ladies, both the ladies, I failed to tell you, were working on some mending as the machines were turning. Both women were working on a set of their husband's pants. One was sewing a, a hole in the seat of the pants, and the other was sewing holes in the knee of those pants. I wonder which one was building his home. Shall we pause for prayer?